This message today has to do with encouragement. We're on our understudies series. This is the third message in the series, and the topic today is encouragement. And um, I want you to take the notes out. I left some notes for you uh, on your chair. It'll be easy for you to follow along in the message. But let me tell you a story before we get started. I, I kind of did some recalibration after the first service. I think I was 32 years old. And I had been on the road for several years. I had been a, a, a youth evangelist for a number of years. But I was on the road now as an evangelist. And I was just getting my voice uh, uh, one of our best preachers on staff is Pastor Terrence, and he knows what I'm talking about. You have to preach for a while until you get your voice, until you get your flow and who you are. And I'd been a youth pastor for a number of years, but I was just getting my voice on the road. And, and I say this very humbly, but you know how we think of life where you're starting to kind of, how do you just upgrade in your professional does that make sense? I, I don't want to get arrogant, but you're starting to improve in your, this is definitely a calling, but it's a profession to end. And, and, and so I was, I was kind of, you know, my name was getting out there a little bit more than that. Jesus was getting out. Can you say amen? But, uh, but, but I, I wasn't very well known, but I was getting my voice and feeling better all the time. And, and, and the, uh, my calendar was full every week flying somewhere. And uh, it was the uh, general council. This has been about 36 or 7 years ago now. And the general council was in Los Angeles. By the way, since that general council, this will be the first time that the general council for the Assemblies of God, 10,000 churches, will be in Los Angeles. And you need to know, church, get ready, that your Trinity Church band, you just heard them, they were up here leading you in worship. They have been asked out of 10,000 churches to be the worship team this coming summer in Los Angeles at the General Council Influence Conference. So I'm very excited about that. But you need to know that it, I was 32, and um, we had been told, all the churches uh, had been warned and, and promoted that Denny Duran, and of course you know now, I don't think, Richie was maybe just born, and Don Cherie wasn't born yet, but my boy Rich married Denny's daughter, Don Cherie, but this is 32 years ago, 30, whatever, eight years, I don't know. I'm, anyway, so Denny was the man among all youth preachers anywhere. This guy was all over the world. He was a professional football player. Uh, he was just wet, and the guy could just preach, just preach the paint off the wall, and all guys that were in the ministry, men at that time, wanted to be like Denny. You know, all you people know about be like Mike. We wanted to be like Denny. And, I mean, he was my hero. He was only a week older than me, but he was my hero. And I wanted to be like Denny. And Denny had been promoted for one year in all the Assemblies of God churches across the nation that at this date in August in Los Angeles, he would be the featured speaker in the big pre convention youth conference thousands of young people and his face was all over America and everybody was looking forward to being with Pastor Denny and so it, it got there I, I raised the money so I could go to the event you know and be at the event and Robin was with me John Fulton was a brand new baby which means that Rich wasn't born yet anyway so um uh it's the service the launch service and about a hundred of us young adult men were in the back you know, kind of a green room area jammed in with Denny, and we're going to pray for Denny before he preaches. The place is thousands of young people. And they say, Denny, we want you to step in the circle. We're going to lay our hands on you and pray for God's anointing. He goes, I have to say something. He said, um, early this morning in prayer, I've been battling it all day, but God spoke to me. The Lord said to me, you're not supposed to preach. you got to stand down. Rich Wilkerson's supposed to preach this event. When he said that, my whole life just kind of ended on that spot. I, I wasn't thrilled. I was shocked because I didn't know I was supposed to be the preacher. I had nothing prepared. He hadn't called me when God called him, you know. And I was shocked. I mean, I was devastated. And you think I was shocked? Every guy in that room barely knew me. They were really shocked. What? And he goes, no, this is it. 
And I want, Rich, you to step in the center of the circle, and I want us to lay our hands on you. And, folks, I walked in just shaking like that, and he laid his hands on me, and then he led the prayer, and a 100 guys laid their hands on me. And, folks, something came on me, the power of the Holy Ghost. And I will tell you, that service was undeniably shocking, an anointing of God, the altars were jammed. I mean, and from that point on, I had so many meetings, I could not take them all. For three years, my calendar was booked because my mentor, my friend, set me up. He encouraged me. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. If you don't have a Bible this morning, I'm sorry you don't, but uh, we do have that on your notes. So take the notes out or look on the screen. We've made it easy for you to follow along. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Today, in this third message in the understudy series, I want to talk on Barnabas and John Mark, the mentor's call to encouragement. Let me quickly call off some nicknames. And when I call the nicknames off, I want you to yell out who that nickname is. Would you do that for me? Okay. First one, Air Jordan. Michael Jordan. You got it. You're so brilliant. Here's one. P. Diddy. Sean Combs. Huh? Some people said Puff Daddy. That's another nickname. Thank you. Uh, For you Miami Heat fans, you remember this name? Flash. Dwayne Wade. Absolutely. The Flash. We got to get him back. Hey, you old-timers in the room, can you remember who was the chairman of the board? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Pastor Terrence knew it in the first service. He's not repeating what he learned. He already knew it. Frank Sinatra. And he's not even an old-timer. Honest Abe. Abraham Lincoln. Hallelujah. Now, today... We're going to talk about a man whose name was Joseph, a Levite, Acts 4, 36 through 7. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, you need to know that Barnabas, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, Barnabas, his nickname means encourager. Barnabas was an apostle. And I want to talk about two things that an encourager has to adhere to. And I hope all of you will want to be an encourager after this meeting because every understudy needs an encourager. The first thing that every mentor must agree to is the call of the encourager. There is a call that every encourager must embrace. Uh, The word encourager comes from a Greek word, parakaleo, which means to call alongside of, to help someone who can't help themselves. It's the picture or metaphor of a person who is in a tough time, big trouble, or physically and or emotionally out of gas. Have you ever been there before? I certainly know I have. Um, In those days, the picture was drawn when they talked about Pericaleo of a man with a heavy load in the desert 
and he's, he's about to drop to the sand because of his exhaustion, a parakaleo shows up out of nowhere, relieves him of his load, restores him, strength re-enters him because he now has an encourager, a parakaleo, to walk the load with him. I always like to use this illustration of a parakaleo. Think with me, especially the football fans in the room, uh, of the, it's a futuristic scenario that we're all longing for. The Miami uh, Hurricanes are back in the national championship. And, and that particular year, the national championship, the Miami Hurricanes against some idiot team, will be played this year in the Orange Bowl. And we don't even know who he is, but they've got a running back who has led the team the entire game. He's run for 200 y yards. But in the second half, he's been battling cramps in his legs. His thighs are cramped up bad. I mean, the trainers on the side have been pouring milk and pickle juice and Gatorade and water and every other kind of liquid down his throat to try to relieve him of the cramping. The team has somehow scored with two seconds to go in the game, and they're down a point. There's a timeout. Are you ready? The coach knows if they kick the extra point and tie it. They got to go into overtime. He knows his star running back can't last the five minutes. Thinks to himself, I believe I can get him out there for one more play. Right up the middle. He's got to leap like nobody. And so he calls the running back and his play. And the running back, some of you guys that have played ball, no. Walks back to the huddle like this, trying to get his thighs hammy and all that stuff, not to freeze up on him. He gets the play, and he walks up, and he leans into the call. The good thing is they're in his team's side of the field. So the end zone is filled with thousands of paracaleos for this guy. They're all his encouragers. They're calling his name. They're calling his number. The noise is so loud, the quarterback has to do the signals with his head. And they hand off with the paracaleos screaming. And the fullback takes the ball and soars one last time into the air, into the end zone. Two points. Boom. Game over. They win. How did he win? Oh, he's a great running back. He's got all the tools, but he's in a bad way. His strength is expended and depleted. He's just over the cramping, but his encouragers pulled him through for one more play. And he knows it. A paracaleo, one called alongside of, was also called a paraclete. The Greek word paraclete was used to denote the Holy Spirit in John 14, 6, and Jesus in 1 John 2, 1. Someone to speak in our defense. Huh. So parakaleo, encourager, is someone who bears the marks of Jesus and operates by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every mentor needs the calling of of an encourager. Can you say amen today, church? I know that in my life, as the pastor of this church now for nearly 19 years, the days that I'm home, which are numerous, I wasn't this week because I was with Dr. Robin, but the reason I seem to live now is to host in my office or on the phone or by way of text young men, 20s and 30s years of age, lots of them, who set appointments to meet with me. And once we get together, I learn of what they said they were coming to. We heal that in two minutes, and then I hear why they really wanted to meet with me. They really wanted to meet with Pastor Rich so he would encourage them because this nation is just about empty of encouragement. They don't get it at school. They don't get it at work. Some don't get it at home. God forbid if they don't get it at the house of God. 
May we be a church that is so full of encouragers and so full of encouragement that we are a magnet for people of all stripes to come flooding here because here's where they will find their encouragement, their parakaleos. Huh. So let's look at this story. That's what Barnabas was to Paul. Now, the story goes like this. Saul is the number one nemesis of the church of Jesus at that time. Saul is the youngest member of the Sanhedrin, which was the legal ruling force of Judaism. And he was a star. All right? He was their next Supreme Court justice. Are you tracking? I'm going to tell you a story today that I don't think five people in the room have ever heard before from the Bible. So Saul is on the road to Damascus because he is going to take Christians in Damascus, haul them back to Jerusalem, have them in prison, probably have them killed. That's what he's been doing. You remember he stood while uh, the young Stephen was martyred. He stood there watching. So, once he is on this road, God knocks him off his feet. He has this vision. He's blinded. He gets into Damascus. He's heard Jesus talk to him. And Ananias, a man of God, leads him to faith in Christ, touches him. Scales fall off his eyes. He's healed, and he's saved and changed. He starts preaching in Damascus. He's sent by Ananias and the brothers there back to Jerusalem. Probably comes back with a note that says, I'm a newborn follower of Christ. I want to preach. What happens when he gets back <laughs> is that the Jews want to kill him because they think he's, they believe he, well, he's, he's a turncoat on them. And the Christians are scared to death of him because they're figuring that he's a plant by the Sanhedrin to get to the heart of Christianity, find out who the key leaders are, kill them. And once the key leaders, the heart of the organization dies, the whole organization dies. So they're all scared to the but Acts 9, 27 and 8. Barnabas, son of encouragement, took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus the Lord. Huh. Well, here's this man who is, they're scared to death of him. But when Barnabas, the encourager, who by the way has encouraged every one of those apostles because they're the ones that gave him the nickname. When they hear him standing up for Paul, Saul, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, Paul, they go, oh no, he's encouraging somebody. Ah, he believes in him like he believed in us. We can't be mad at the guy. we got to believe in Saul, Paul, Paul, Saul. We've got to believe in him. And they give him the opportunity to preach. How many think that Barnabas called it right? Amen. Amen. Now, here's the deal. If Barnabas doesn't step up, who knows if Saul, Paul's ministry would have ever been launched. The ministry of the encourage of the encourager is what opens the door for understudies that other people wouldn't have even trusted. Huh? Now, here's someone else in the book of Acts that he encourages. Let's go back to our text. The scripture on the back is, is incorrect. That's my fault. I put the wrong verse down. It's 15, not 5. Acts. Back to the original text. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. This is interesting. In the first missionary journey, you can read this in Acts 13, 1 through 7, the elders in Jerusalem commissioned Barnabas, the apostle, 
to be the lead preacher and Paul to be the assistant teacher on the first missionary journey. Along with them was Dr. Luke. You'll notice after this story, Dr. Luke is always with Paul. Paul could preach for other people's, pray for other people's healing by God, but when it came to himself, he wanted a human guy standing right there. Dr. Luke, are you with me? A real medical doctor. Okay, just want to set that record. He had faith for others, but for himself, not much. So he always took Dr. Luke with him, but initially it was Barnabas' call, we need Luke. We need you, Paul. But we need an understudy. That'll be my cousin. He's pretty young. John Mark, probably 16 years of age. They get on the road, and just a few weeks into it at Pamphylia, Mark, most theologians agree, got chicken. Or he's, he's supposed to be carrying their luggage. He gets chicken and runs back home to Jerusalem, back to Mama. He's scared. You can imagine the rest of the trip, Paul's going out, oh, that little... Punk, that, that idiot. I'd like to get my hands. He never got a spanking when he was. I'll tell you right now. Barnabas probably said nothing. They get back. Time for the second journey. Barnabas says, of course, we'll be taking John Mark again. Paul says, oh, I don't think so. No, no, I don't think so. I don't believe we're going to take him. Barnabas says, oh, yeah, we're going to take him. I'm taking him. He says, no, we're not. Barnabas says, okay, then I'll take him. I'm out. Let me say something. The encourager is all about hanging out with the understudy until the understudy wins. It's standing up for someone that can't stand up for themselves. It's called to be alongside of until they can go on their own. It's called the call of encouragement. The second thing I want to say about the pericaleo, the encouragers, there is a cost to be an encourager. The encourager is willing to risk his or her entire reputation to see the understudy win. Let me ask you a question. Barnabas's first understudy was St. Paul. Let me ask you this question. Who in Jerusalem really knew if all that stuff had happened to Paul? They get word from Ananias, there's been a change. Do you believe every word that comes to you? No, I don't. And neither did any of the apostles in Jerusalem, except for one. Barney. He says, hey, we all know Ananias. We believe Ananias. He's a man of God. Are you kidding me? He had to be as scared when this guy showed up in his presence as you guys are right now. Come on. Let's believe the good report. Let's give this guy a shot. Huh. And so all the apostles, okay, we'll give him a shot. Huh. Lighten up. So they do. Now. It comes time to give John Mark a chance. How many of you have ever needed a second chance in your life? You messed up so bad, but you needed a second chance. Anybody at all? Thank you for being honest. I got both hands and both. I, I'm sitting, so I got, I got all four limbs sticking high. Man, I've messed up so many times. Man, I've needed a 14th and 15th and 16th chance. Paul, no. Barnabas, come on, man. Come on. Come on. You got to give this guy another chance. I'm not doing it. Remember the kid ran up. Do you remember when I was laying dead in Lystra? Yeah, I remember Barnabas says, I was there. Luke never left you. I didn't leave you. You got up. God healed you. We made it. Let's give the kid another chance. I'm not going to do it. Barnabas, fine. Have a great life. I'm out. And he takes the boy. And the Bible doesn't say they commended him. There's no fanfare for Barnabas and John... Mark, they'll go, oh, that's right. He's like, okay, Mr. Star Paul. And Paul was a star. He gets Luke again as his 
doctor, take Silas as his assistant teacher and a new understudy, Timothy, who he calls his son in the ministry. How many remember, remember Tim, Timothy? Okay. And they head out of their second tour. And Barnabas is never heard from again in the New Testament. Why? Probably because Paul wrote most of the rest of the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books. <laughs> I ain't talking about Barnabas no more. <laughs> Remember reading Acts now. Most of the rest of the Bible, Paul wrote. But we do hear about John Mark again a couple times. And one time, guess who's writing about him? St. Paul. 25 years later, 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul's an old man. He's three years away from his execution. He's in prison in Rome. And he says, he writes to Timothy, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in the ministry. Oh, dear goodness. Folks, what was the difference? What was the game changer? I'll tell you what the game changer was. The game changer was the guy that Paul wouldn't talk about anymore. Uncle Barney, the encourager, the mentor that risked his entire reputation to see this young man become the man that God had called him to be. Huh. Wow. History tells us that Barnabas, with no fanfare, takes John Mark to Cyprus. They establish a church there. Remember, he's Joseph the Levite from Cyprus. So he's kind of disregarded by his home team in Jerusalem. He goes back home, takes the boy with him, teaches him everything he can teach him. And guess what happens after that? This is the part most of you have never heard of in your life. Barnabas takes him as far as he can take him. Then he hands John Mark off to his old friend, St. Peter, to take him the rest of the way. And Peter does the graduate training, postgraduate work for John Mark. John Mark, historians tell us, became Peter's personal assistant for years to the point that John Mark is called by the apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5.13, his son. John Mark becomes Peter's Timothy. And every historical researcher's of the biblical canon agree that St. Peter, listen to me, is the author of the book of St. Mark. But that Peter is speaking all those words to his associate, John Mark. And John Mark is the writer of the book that bears his name. Remember, John Mark isn't even alive probably while Jesus is walking the certainly doesn't know the stories. Peter recounts all the stories to his understudy, John Mark, the apostle. John Mark records it all. And then historians tell us that John Mark, they have proof, worked closely with St. Luke, the doctor. And they coordinated and confirmed the stories so that their gospels were synoptic, that they were parallel to each other. So their facts were straight. Isn't that amazing? The old man, Paul, says, I got to see him before I die. He died in three years later. You see, St. Mark, John Mark, had taken the gospel to Alexandria and had established 
Jesus' ministry in Alexandria. He, too, was the apostle Mark. Paul died an old man in A.D. 68. But the young man, St. Mark, who was probably in his 40s, he died the same year a martyr's death, dragged to death by chariots by the people in Alexandria who disagreed with the gospel he preached. Ah. None of us want to be dragged to death, but all of us admire anyone who's died for Christ. I've been talking about encouraging those around you, especially new believers who mess up, you know. I think of the drug addicts that I've led to Christ through the years, and some of them slipped back into drug abuse. What are you, you idiot? You should have known Jesus set you free. And I've never been a drug addict. I've never had to break that addiction. I've never done that. Who would do that? What religious freak would do that? You don't do that. You pick them back up. You encourage them. Come on, man. We're going to get past this. We're going to win. We'll get past it. To speak for those who can't speak for themselves. You know, I hate to admit it. I guess we all have. I go to movies. I like movies. I just, I never could, you know, figure out why when I was a kid I wasn't allowed to go to movies, but we could watch them on TV. I, I never could feel, I, I never could feel, like, it's okay if it's on your TV, but not to, you know, I was a real strict Pentecostal growing up. Ah, I got out of the house. Dad said, you're on your own. I said, fine. Figured I wasn't rebelling anymore since I was on my own. Went to movies. I love movies. Uh, one of my favorite movies is called Scent of a Woman. And it came out about 100 years ago, just after I was born. <laughs> and it's the story of Al Pacino plays the key role. Frank, who's a retired colonel in the army, and he's blind. And he's done a lot of messing up in the army, even though he's achieved the rank of a colonel. Obviously, he's disabled now, and so his retirement is significant. And he's living with his niece, the only person on the planet that would have him. Of course, he pays her well. And she's got to go on vacation or on a party over the weekend of Thanksgiving weekend. And she says to Chris O'Donnell, the original Batman, uh, Chris is playing the part of a young guy named Charlie who's going to a college prep high school in the East. He's from Oregon, has no money. He's won a scholarship to Baird, this great, you know, college prep high school. And he's there on scholarship. All the young men there are from stinking wealthy homes. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and Charlie's there on scholarship and trying to match up with him, and one night he sees four of his friends break in, you know, to the dean's quarters and vandalize it. They don't even know he sees it, and there's lots of guys around, but he sees it, and so there's an investigation. They find out that he's a witness, and so they put these four young men on trial, and they will be expelled from this school, and once expelled, they have no chance of getting into any Ivy League school, which their fathers and mothers have all been a part of. Of course, Charlie is just hoping to get a scholarship to some university somewhere. It comes down to the fact that Charlie ends up being the only eyewitness, and he will have to speak against his friends at this trial. When he does, they'll be expelled. So he goes... He goes to, this girl says, hey, Charlie, if you'll watch my uncle for the weekend, Thanksgiving, you know, I'll pay you well, enough for you to get home and back for Christmas. He says, I'll do it. So he meets this guy, and the guy's real crusty. The guy ends up taking him to New York City for three days, showing him the town. Of course, this guy's blind. He has a walking stick, you know, with the red tip on it, blind. But he's always dressed up in his dress blues, looking like a million bucks. But really, he's taken Charlie there to be in New York one more time because he's going to kill himself while he's there. And Charlie talks him down from the ledge, so to speak. And they head back home to Baird 
And Charlie is freaking. He's got this load on his back the entire trip. All he can think about is, I got to face the music. I got to speak against my friends. And when he gets home and sits in front of 400 young men, fellow students, and the main perpetrator is with his father across the stage, and he sits alone. The disciplinary team is on the stage, and the dean is there to pronounce the verdict. Because Charlie will not sell his friends out. He says, there were a lot of guys, that, they look like a lot of bared men. I'm, I can't speak for sure. And so the dean is going to bring it down, and he's going to be expelled. His life is over. While this is going on, Frank, Colonel Frank, walks in the back door with his walking stick, feeling his way down all the way to the stage, gets to the stage, takes his coat off, his overcoat, and sits on the stage next to Charlie, since Charlie has no one to speak for him. And here's what happens. I thought you'd like to see it. Could the disciplinary committee... Cut the lights, please. ...that you be expelled. Mr. Sims, you are a cover-up artist, and you are a liar. But not a snitch! Excuse me? No, I don't think I will. Please watch your language, Mr. Slade. You are in the Barrett School, not a barracks. Mr. Sims, I will give you one final opportunity to speak on. Mr. Sims doesn't want it. He doesn't need to be labeled still worthy of being a bad man. What is your motto here? Boys, inform on your classmates. Save your hide. Anything short of that, we're going to burn you at the stake? Well, gentlemen. Some guys run, and some guys stay. Here's Charlie facing the fire, and there's George hiding in Big Daddy's pocket. And what are you doing? You're going to reward George and destroy Charlie. Are you finished, Mr. Slade? No, I'm just getting warmed up. I don't know who went to this place. William Howard Taft, William Jennings Bride, William Tell, whoever. Their spirit is dead, if they ever had one. It's gone. You're building a rat ship here. A vessel for seagoing snitches. And if you think you're preparing these minnows for manhood, you better think again. Because I say you are killing the very spirit this institution proclaims it instills. What a sham. What kind of a show are you guys putting on here today? I mean, the only class in this act is sitting next to me, and I'm here to tell you, this boy's soul is intact. It's non-negotiable. You know how I know? Someone here, and I'm not going to say who, offered to buy it. Only Charlie here wasn't selling. Sir, you're out of order. Out of order? I show you out of order. You don't know what out of order is, Mr. Trask. I'd show you, but I'm too old. If I were the man I was five years ago, I'd take a flamethrower to this place. I've been around, you know. There was a time I could see, and I have seen boys like these, younger than these, their arms torn out, their legs ripped off. But there is nothing like the sight of an amputated spirit. There is. No prosthetic for that. You think you're merely sending this splendid foot soldier back home to Argonne with his tail between his legs, but I say you are executing his soul! And why? Because he's not a bad man. Bad men. You hurt this boy, you're gonna be bad bums. The lot of you. Stand down, Mr. Slade. I'm not finished. As I came in here, I heard those words. Cradle of leadership. Well, when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And it has fallen here. It has fallen. Makers of men. Creators of leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. I don't know. If Charlie's silence here today is right or wrong, I'm not a judge or jury, but I can tell you this. He won't sell anybody out to buy his future. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. 
Now that's the stuff leaders should be made of. Now I have come to the crossroads in my life. I always knew what the right path was. Without exception, I knew, but I never took it. You know why? It was too hard. Now here's Charlie. He's come to the crossroads. He has chosen a path. It's the right path. It's a path made of principle that leads to character. Let him continue on his journey. You hold this boy's future in your hands, committee. It's a valuable future. Believe me, don't destroy it. Protect it. Embrace it. It's gonna make you proud one day, I promise you. That's called the look of a paracaleo, an encourager. I'm sure that many of you have had someone in your life that has encouraged you along the way. I know I have. Some of you have not been that fortunate. You've had to make it on your own. But I want you to know, if you haven't, there is one who has stood for you when you couldn't stand for yourself. Because Revelation 12, 10 says that all day long, the devil stands at the throne of God accusing you and you and you and every last one of you, us, in this room of everything we did last night and last week and last month and through our lives. He keeps hashing it out. Even stuff that's already under the blood. He reminds God, reminds God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that King Jesus steps in with his nail print hands and feet and ribbon side and says, Dad, I'm the reason why they are free. I went to the cross. He speaks for us when we can't speak for ourselves. He is our ultimate paracaleo. Today, God is calling us, a church, individuals, to be encouragers of younger ones coming up behind us, to be mentors who are called to risk it all so that someone else can win. I want you to bow your head with me. I've gone a little long today. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I wonder how many would just say, Pastor Rich, I so desperately need to be forgiven today. I've been hearing the devil tell me what a louse I am for the past week, past month. Pastor, I just, I got to get, would you include me in your final prayer? I need to be forgiven by God. Would you please, Pastor, I need God's forgiveness today. If that's you, if you'd like for me to include you in my final prayer, I want you to raise your hand right now. Real, real high, over the room, real high. I'll see it. Yes, 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 yes. I see yours in the very back. Yes, yes, and yours as well. Yes, I see yours over here. How many more over here? See your hand, sir. Over here, I see your hand and your hand as well. How about the overflow? Yeah, oh man, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What about the bleachers? Any one of the bleachers? Hallelujah. Hey, stand to your feet, everybody. Everyone standing. We're going to sing that song, There is Power. And on the first word of the song, if you raise your hand, come on, get some guts today. If you raise your hand, I want to pray with you personally right at this altar. I'm going to ask that you step from where you are. Come and stand with me. Let me take your name to Jesus in prayer. Let's walk out of this room free today. Say, Pastor, if I go down there, people will see me. That's the whole point.